Here is an interesting thought by Thomas More, saying, If I had two souls, I could gamble one. But since I have only one, I must save it. Of course, we know that we do not have two souls, that we are a soul. Today's presentation was very difficult for me to put together and to swallow because of the way I have been taught and believed most of my life. We must be willing to prove all things, even if we don't understand it in the beginning. I would like to say that it is not my intention, nor desire to offend, to judge, or to condemn any one with any of my presentations, but to humbly present what I have found in Scripture. No one should have to sacrifice who they are and what they believe just because someone else has a problem with it. And especially with this presentation, which is a very difficult for people to swallow to understand. And as I have mentioned before, because the way we have been taught. Our Savior stated in John 8.32, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Of course, the question is, free from what? Free from organized man-made religion and the doctrines and commandments of men. The fact that we believe something to be true for a long time, maybe even, maybe even for years, doesn't make it true. Truth is truth whether we believe it or not. Truth stands on its own. Truth doesn't change if I or someone else believes it or not. Remember, only the truth can make us free. Yeshua told the Samaritan woman in John 4.24, Yahweh is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So not only in spirit, but also in truth. Then the question is, are you, am I established in the truth of uh, Yahweh's word, or am I following traditions? We must be established in his truth, so we can worship our Heavenly Father in truth. In Second Corinthians 11, 13 to 14, it says, there are false prophets, apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. False apostles, deceitful workers, claiming to be apostles of the Messiah, and Satan himself comes as an angel of light. One of the duties of a follower of Yahshua is to test the prophets. It is commanded in the Bible and failure to do so is disobedient to Yahweh's word. Here we have a verse in 1 John 4 1. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but do what? Try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And that also happened 2,000 years ago. So we are commanded to try the spirits. We can just accept everything we hear, or we uh, don't accept everything we hear. And the only way we can try them is by the Word. And we must start at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Will false prophets introduce themselves as false apostles? as a false messiah, or will they claim to be true apostles and the true messiah? The fact is that their voices are probably most likely to be soft and subdued when they come to deceive. Full of melody and in gentle, compassionate tones, they will quote scripture and present some of the same gracious heavenly truths which Yahshua uttered. But they will claim that neither the weekly nor the yearly Sabbaths are binding 
today, as we live under a new covenant, the Torah was for the Jews. They will say that those that do keep these things are actually blaspheming the Father's name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. Remember, Satan is a liar from the beginning, and so are his apostles. There will be strong delusions sent in the last days. In Matthew 24, 24 to 25, Yahshua said, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, so what will they do? They will try to deceive the very elect, if that is possible. Notice a false teacher, a false prophet, looks like a sheep, but in reality is a wolf, but his message is not from heaven. Some false teachers preach a broad way to heaven, while Yeshua preaches a narrow way. When the grace of God is preached as a license to sin, then his grace has been turned into lasciviousness. Some false teachers mix truth with error, preach only partial truth, but remember, 99% of truth with 1% error or poison may be enough to lead one in a different direction, maybe into fanaticism. Paul stated, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Has that taken place? We are talking about strong delusions, and the question I had, what is a delusion? So I looked it up, it says a delusion is an error which, when viewed from certain standpoints of observation, has the appearance of truth. When a man is deluded, he really thinks he's right. He claims to be honest in his convictions. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof where the subject of delusion is of vital interest, are the ways of death. Proverbs 16.25 In the year 2006, over one billion people called themselves Muslims. It is the biggest religion on the planet and the fastest growing in terms of numbers of new adherents. The whole religion is based upon the writings of Prophet Muhammad. Now when we say writings, we must remember that Muhammad was illiterate. So he depended upon literary assistance to do his writings for him. If you decided to follow Muhammad, it would impact every aspect of your life. It would impact what you eat and drink. It would impact what you say and to whom you say it. It would impact how and when you worship. It would impact your perception of who God is and what He expects of you. It would impact what you do and it would impact how you relate to others that are outside your group. Islam impacts every area of your life. If you are following a prophet and what the prophet tells you is false, that wrong teaching could have far-reaching effects upon almost every aspect of your life. It could impact your health, your relationships with others, even your relationship with God. David states in Psalm 119.104, I hate every false way. Does our Creator hate every false way? Remember, we can only worship Him in spirit and in truth. To worship him as the pagans do is not acceptable. A man finds a book of Mormon in his hotel room and reads it. His heart is warmed by the stories of love for God and courage. He says, whoever penned such beautiful, encouraging words must be a prophet of God. He ends up joining the Latter-day Saints without ever 
studying the merits of the prophet Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith advocated health reforms years ahead of science. He predicted future events. He guided his church to amazing membership growth. He wrote many beautiful, inspiring words. Many are born into a church with a prophet. They grow up accepting it and never challenge the idea during their lifetime. Many do not realize that following a prophet's teachings can have a tremendously powerful impact on every area of their life. They devote little time to researching the prophet, to testing him or her, to find out if their claims are true. How many Muslims, Mormons, or Seventh-day Adventists have really taken the time to sit down and study out whether or not their prophet is everything they claim to be and is teaching what the Bible says. With so much online on the line, isn't it worth a little investigating? I know I became a Seventh-day Adventist as a teenager in Germany coming out of the Lutheran Church and accepted everything without really checking things out myself if these things are so according to Scripture. With so many prophets out there in the world today, how can we determine which ones are true and which ones are false prophets? Have you ever asked someone why they believe a prophet? Here is what some people say. Mary Baker Eddy's writings on health and spirituality have been such a blessing to my life. She must have been inspired. How could Mohammed have written such masterful works Without any education, God must have assisted him. Joseph Smith predicted the Civil War would start in South Carolina 29 years before it started. God must have inspired him. Nostradamus predicted the rise of Hitler and World War II. Mohammed's teachings on diet and health are only now being validated by science after a uh, 1,000 years. Scripture says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. But is there really an excuse for such knowledge? There is no excuse for lack of knowledge, for not knowing the truth, for not knowing the genuine gospel, because Isaiah 8.20 tells us how one can separate truth from error. He says to the law, to the Torah, and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. We know what the law is. It is the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the instructions given to his people through Moses. But what is the testimony? That would be the prophetic word, the source of trustworthy guidance, the testimony of the prophets focused and encouraged every generation to a faithful adherence to that Torah, the instructions of Yahweh given to Moses. We read in Second Chronicles 20.20, 20, Believe in Yahweh your Elohim, the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. Paul warned of a day when men would embrace false teachings, as we read in 1 Timothy 4, 3-4. He says the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned into fables. Here again we have the false apostles coming in preaching whatever people like to hear, but not what Yahweh says. Truth versus fables. Then he says in Galatians 1.8, Though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Did you know that Paul never ca called himself a Christian? 
Even though people try to make one out of him, he defined himself as a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Acts twenty three six. Here are his own words in Philippians three five about himself. He says, "Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, the Torah, a Pharisee." Paul claims that he had studied at the feet of Gamaliel, a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, and renowned teacher of Yahweh's Torah, Acts twenty two three, Acts five thirty four to thirty nine. What did it mean to be brought up at the feet of Gamaliel, according to Acts twenty two three? That means Jewish boys between the age of six and ten memorize the Torah. The first five books of the Bible, and by the age of fourteen, the best of the best students had the entire Hebrew Scripture memorized. And you can read this on this website website down here. Paul knew the Torah by heart, and he was a Torah observant Jew. And we need to read all his letters through the eyes of the Torah, and not the other way around. As it is being done today, the same applies to our Savior Yeshua of Nazareth, was raised in an observant Jewish family in a culture where the Torah was a national constitution. Therefore, he was a Torah observant, talent wearing, synag uh, synagogue attending, kosher Jew, who observed the weekly Sabbath, as well as the seven commanded holy days. Yeshua's teachings, which supposedly form the basis for Western Christianity, are now filtered through two thousand years of traditions, born in ignorance of the land, language, and culture of the Scripture. So, contrary to popular belief, Yeshua did not bring a new religion into the world. The truth is that modern-day Christianity has very little in common with the Hebrew Messiah. The word Christianity is not even found in Scripture. Neither is there such a religion known from Genesis to Revelation. It is not the religion that Yeshua established. Christianity as a system, as a whole, is corrupted, as Scripture puts it. Could it have, over the centuries, evolved in the religion of Antichrist, called the synagogue of Satan? Don't be shocked. Here is where and when the real deception started. Constantine's intention at Nicaea was to create an entirely new god for his empire, who would unite all religious factions under one deity. Presbyters were asked to debate and decide who the new god would be. Delegates argued among themselves, expressing personal motives for inclusion of particular writings that promoted the finer traits of their own special deity. Throughout the meetings, howling factions were immersed in heated debates, and the names of fifty-three gods were tabled for discussion. As yet, no god had been selected by the council, and so they balloted in order to determine that matter. For one year and five months, the balloting lasted. That's from God's Book of Ezra. At the end of the time, Constantine returned to the gathering to discover that the presbyters had not agreed on the new deity, but had balloted down to a short list of five prospects: Caesar, Krishna, Mithra, Horus, and Zeus. Constantine was the ruling spirit at Nicaea, and he ultimately decided upon a new god for them. To involve British factions, he ruled that the name of the great Druid god, Hesus, be joined with the Eastern savior god Krishna, and thus Hesus, Krishna, would be the official name of the new Roman god. A vote was taken, and it was with a majority show of hands 
161 votes to 157, that both divinities became one God. Following long-standing heathen custom, Constantine used the official gathering and the Roman apotheosis decree to legally deify two deities as one, and did so by democratic consent. A new god was proclaimed and officially ratified by Constantine. That purely political act of deification effectively and legally placed Jesus and Krishna among the Roman gods as one individual composite. That abstraction lent earthly existence to amalgamated doctrines for the empire's new religion and because there was no letter J in alphabets until around the ninth century, the name subsequently evolved in Jesus Christ. And you can read this under that website I have listed. So Constantine introduced the Greek Messiah, a false Christ, which is being worshipped today by most people. Now Christianity is divided into over 38,000 churches, denominations, sects, and cults, preaching a false perverted gospel, but still claiming to have the truth. And of course we know that most of them are doing it ignorantly, but they still believe they have the key to salvation. You talk about confusion. During the Middle Ages, the only recognized religion was the Catholic Church. From birth to death, whether you were a peasant, a serf, a noble, a lord, or a king, life was dominated by the Catholic Church. She still considers herself the Mother Church. Martin Luther was raised up to do a special work to tear off the garb of hypocrisy from the papal church and rebuked the existing sins of the leaders and through his stand and efforts we have the Lutheran Church and I was raised in the Lutheran Church because my father was Lutheran. That was one step away from Rome and towards the first century church. I agree. By the way, this here is a church I used to go as a child when my father in Stuttgart, Germany and this church was called Johanneskirche am Feuersee. Luther's greatest achievement was the German Bible. No other work has had a strong an impact on a nation's development and heritage as has this book. This allowed everyone to have access to the scriptures and gave the common people the ability to read the word of Yahweh. However, the Reformation did not, as many suppose, end with Luther. It was being continued and is to be continued to the close of this world's history. As the next two slides show, many new churches, sects and cults sprang up after Luther in 1517 of the Common Era trying to return to the teachings of the first century church. And here we have a list of the main ones. On the left side we have the uh, faith group or tradition, then their founder, and the date they were established, and the location. Here on the next slide we have some more churches that were established during the 1800s and early 1900s and in the middle we see the Seventh-day Adventist Church and their founder was basically more or less Ellen White and the date the church was established was in 1863 in Michigan, USA. Even though there was a spiritual revival going on, there's no question. Satan was doing his part in order to stop any real and complete reformation and every new group stopped at some point in their efforts to reform. Almost all Christian denominations, sects and cults claim, believe 
and teach that they are the only one, the only two church. And I listed a few examples here. The uh, Mormon church, it says, this church is the only true and living church on the face of the whole earth. We have Jeho Jehovah's Witness. They say, we acknowledge as the visible organization of Jehovah on earth, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. The International Church of Christ, there is one church. There is one God. There is one kingdom of God, and this is it. Seventh-day Adventist, since we keep all the Ten Commandments and have Ellen White as our prophet, we Seventh-day Adventists are the remnant church. In the case of Ellen White, she told the believers that Satan has taken full possession of the churches, meaning all the other denominations except, of course, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And she writes that in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 5, pages 189 to 90, and that was published in 1858. Here we have the Philadelphia Church of God, the household is God's family or true church. It's a family that God rules. This is God's inner circle, his very elect. We are God's only true representative on this earth. We are the last hope the world has in the National Church of Christ. God has made no covenant with any other church, they claim. Church of God in Christ, Mennonite, John Holderman. Here's the living Church of God. It is the true Church of God, which teaches and practices apostolic Christianity. There's no doubt that all these people were sincere about their organization but sincerity is, in and of itself, is not necessarily an indication that a religion's message is true. Many, if not all, religious groups have sincere followers, no question whatsoever. What happened to cause all these groups to suddenly appear? We read here in one, on uh, one website, in the early 1800s, Long-lasting spiritual awakening began in Newark, New Jersey, with a day of humiliation and prayer for the mighty work of the Spirit. Christians banded together to pray for the pastors. Entire congregations were deeply moved through intense prayer. Ministers and pairs preached in prepared, in prepared congregations and saw large numbers profess faith. There was a sudden interest in proclaiming the second coming of the Messiah. And this was inspired by the spirit of Elohim, but also been taken advantage of by Satan himself, the arch deceiver. He always is there if there is an apparent revival. One of the denominations that came into existence in the 1800s, as I had mentioned, is the Seventh Day Adventist Church. And at the age of 17, I joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church because of some more biblical truths like the weekly Sabbath, the mortality of the soul, baptism by immersion, that they upheld that had been changed mainly by Rome during the 3rd and 4th century. I was a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church for over 50 years. I was taught and believed with all my heart that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is a remnant church and is the only church entrusted with the truth for the last days. To my astonishment and amazement, when I began studying the Bible lately, I made the shocking discovery that some of the teachings of this church do not agree with the scriptures. I found that some SDA teachings are not based upon scripture at all, but upon tradition, conjecture of the early pioneers and statements made by Alan White. I realize that my salvation is not tied to the Seventh-day Adventist Church denomination. They do not have the key to heaven. Actually, no denomination on earth has a key to heaven.
no matter what they claim. So my presentation today is called the Seventh Day Adventist Church, as well as Ellen White and Scripture. Do we dare ask questions? Shouldn't we be like the Bereans in Acts 17.11, where it states these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and search the scriptures daily whether those things were the, so? They did not accept everything Paul pre presented without first comparing it with scripture, mainly the Torah. I wondered at times how can anyone ever leave the Seventh-day Adventist Church as they have the truth. I felt if people left Adventism, it was because they had lost their spiritual direction or had fallen into some sinful lifestyle. However, often people are leaving Adventism in order to become more devoted to their Savior. As more truth from the Torah is revealed to them, and as they realize how far Christianity has departed from the first century church, they desire to follow the one whom they love more closely and keep the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and of course Israel. So let's consider some teaching of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, since that is a church that I am familiar with and was part of, was in love with, and was very active in for over 50 years. Just like Paul in the Bible, I defended the doctrines and the teaching with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my mind. This will not be a complete listing or study of all the teachings. I will be just touching some points of the teachings and on questions that I personally had. There were some questions which I personally had when considering the continuation of my membership in the SDA denomination. This was nothing, has nothing to do with individual church members, as I dearly liked them and had a good relationship with many, and I'm sure there's no question that most of them are very sincere and they want to do the right thing, like in any other denomination that people are being brought up under. My basic question was, are the doctrines of the SDA denomination truly based on the Bible alone? I had already discovered that today's Christians, for the most part, do not accept the Torah, keeping the weekly Sabbath, nor Yahweh's appointed festivals. Seventh-day Adventists do keep the weekly Sabbath, but refuse to accept his appointed weekly Sabbath, yearly Sabbath, I mean, as an example just like all the other Christian churches do, claiming that they ended at the cross. However, they have no problem keeping Christmas, the birthday of Tammuz, which is actually Baal worship, and other non-biblical holidays, which are an abomination in the sight of our Heavenly Father. That made me think, as I read in Scripture, that Yahweh's appointed times are still binding. They have never been done away by Him, it was Rome that removed them and replaced them with the holidays. So is it okay to ask these questions? Then I asked myself the question, why do Christians, including Seventh-day Adventists, call the Hebrew Messiah by a Greek name, Jesus? Did you realize that? Messiah's given name was Yeshua. He was a Torah-observant, talent-wearing, synagogue-attending, Sabbath and feast-keeping, kosher Hebrew. Jesus is the Hellenized, Anglicized form of Yeshua. Jesus doesn't mean anything, while Yeshua means salvation. Christianity and the Hebrew Yeshua are worlds apart. Christianity is a religion mixed with much paganism. I also asked myself the question, why was the all-powerful name of the Most High Yahweh, which is mentioned almost 7,000 times in Scripture, replaced with the title, Lord? The World Bible Encyclopedia explains that the words 
the Lord means Baal. Yahweh told us that his name would be removed by the priest who caused my people to forget my name. It has been prophesied. As their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. Jeremiah 23, 27. Is Christianity doing the same today? Baal is the Hebrew name of the deity the nation served each time they went into apostasy. And it dates back to Nimrod and the days of Babylonian pagan worship. Our Heavenly Father does not want to be called by another's name, by a name of a no-god, and tells us in Revelation 18.4 to come out of false worship. Now let's first consider Alan White's writing for a moment, called by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, The Spirit of Prophecy. Seventh-day Adventists consider Alan White to be a divinely inspired prophet equal to the prophets of the Bible, which I also believed. She produced an estimated 100,000 handwritten pages of manuscripts. Arthur White claimed that she had 2,000 visions during her lifetime. However, only 203 visions were published. Her own personal library contained nearly 2,000 books, thus she was widely read. She repeatedly referred to a young man that had appeared to her and by 1875 had instructed her for some 26 years. She called him her accompanying angel. And you can read that in early writings, um, page 38, 77, 243, and in Testament to the Church, volume 4, 306, volume 5, 68, volume 9, 92 and 94. The Seventh-day Adventist claim of Ellen White having 2,000 visions can be seen on a plaque, on a plaque located at Oak Hill Cemetery, Battle Creek, Michigan, where James and Ellen White are buried. Seventh-day Adventist belief, and at that time it was 27 doctrines, proudly states as fact that Ellen G. White had more than 2,000 visions. They did not say that it was an estimate or who had reported this as fact. Seventh-day Adventist belief, page 224, from 1844, when she was 17, until 1915, the year of her death, she had more than 2,000 visions. Here are some more statements or examples from Seventh-day Adventist sources which claimed that she had 2,000 visions during a lifetime. Here's one uh, from Loma Linda Medical. Seventh-day Adventist belief today that the source of her writings, the source of the inspiration was more than human, that the 2,000 visions given her during her lifetime were the result of her having received the gift of prophecy. Here, Michigan Historical Markers. Ellen, a prophetess, reportedly experienced over 2,000 visions. Here we have another one. She lived for 88 years, during which time she received over 2,000 visions and prophetic dreams. Here we have another one. Ellen's life was enriched by over 2,000 visions from God. The first in 1844, when she was 17. Here we have another website. She received about 2,000 visions and prophetic dreams during 70 years of public ministry. And then an another one here. Where did Ellen White get her information? She got it in the 2,000 visions that she experienced during her lifetime. The White Estate's own index to the writings of Ellen White, Volume 3, page 2,978 to 2,984, add up to only about 188 dated visions and 15 updated visions for Ellen G. White when this was published here. Total dated visions 188 that were actually dated. That means two and a half average per year, not even close to 2,000 divisions. 2,000 visions, I mean. Would that be a fair question to ask here? Where are the remaining 1,800 visions or dreams that are being claimed that she had?
How do these facts compare to the experience of Bible prophets? Did any Bible prophet have as many as 2,000 or at least 200 visions? Let's examine that. Here I have a list that I copied from a book. It says the frequency of major Bible prophecies vision. Ellen White, of course, was 2,000. And the total visions mentioned in the Bible are 42. And here we have the various prophets. And it looks like that uh, the one who had most of the vision was Ezekiel with seven. And then following Zechariah with six. And Amos with five. And Haggai with five and so on. So if Ellen White truly had 2,000 visions, then let's be honest and serious, or even, even uh, 200, one could say that Ellen White must have been of the greatest prophets that ever lived on earth. Or am I wrong? Why was Ellen White's experience so different from that of Bible prophets? Is it okay to ask that question? Could she have had a different source of a vision? That's just a question, because I want an answer. Ellen White claims to have repeatedly held conversations with angels for over or some 71 years, both in vision and in real life. Did anyone in the Bible have similar experiences? Did any Bible prophet have a special angel guide for more than three decades? Is it wrong again to ask such questions? The facts are that out of hundreds of people mentioned by name in the Bible, only 29 ever spoke with an angel or experienced an angel speaking with them or had an angel appear to them. Consider the next slide. In 1961, in the village of San Sebastian, de Garabendal in northwestern Spain, four young girls with the following names here, reportedly had a series of visions of Saint Michael, the Archangel, and the Blessed Virgin. In all, there were reported to be over 2,000 apparitions spread over a five-year period. During these apparitions, the visionaries claimed that they were asked by the Blessed Virgin to plead with humanity to do what? to return to God through prayer, fasting, frequent confession, and reception, of course, of the Eucharist and acts of mercy. You can find this under this website here. And according to Arthur White, Alan White received her 2,000 vision over a 70-year period. Most members of the Mormon Church believe that Joseph Smith told the truth when he said that he was visited by God, by Jesus, and by a multitude of angels. He claims that he had received literally hundreds of visions and other revelations, all inspired or given by God. Joseph Smith claimed to be a prophet of Yahweh. But was he? Even though he may claim to have had hundreds of visions, that doesn't make him a true prophet, or does it? There are ways to find out. Did he contradict scripture? Did any of its prophecies fail? He did contradict scriptures, and some of his prophecies failed. Therefore, he must be a false prophet. No question. In Deuteronomy 18.25, Yahweh said, When a prophet speaketh in the name of Yahweh, If the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which Yahweh has not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. A prophet does not have to make predictions in order to be a prophet. A prophet is defined as somebody who interprets or passes, passes on the will of a deity. That's in the Encarta Dictionary. Typically, however, biblical prophets do make predictions about future events. These predictions help to establish the claims and validity of a prophet because knowledge of future events surpasses human ability and resides in the domain of omnipotent power. Jeremiah writes that when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that Yahweh has truly sent him. 
Jeremiah 28, verse 9. On September 1, 1849, Ellen White stated in the Review and Herald or the Present Truth, What we have seen and heard of the pestilence is but the beginning of what we shall see and hear. Soon the dead and dying will be all around us. I saw that some will be so hardened as to even make sport of the judgment of God. And the question I have, what does soon mean in the year of 1849? It has been over 160 years. She said the dead would be around us. That sounds like that would include her. She was saying the dead would be around her. This never happened in her lifetime. But could that be a prophetic failure? In 1850, Sister White tells us what an angel told her. She said, my accompanying angel said, time is almost finished. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Now time is almost finished. And when we have, and what we have seen, been uh, years learning, they will have to learn in a few months. Early writing 66 to 67. No converts will have to learn the doctrines in a few months. Because now time is almost finished. What is a reasonable definition of a phrase a few months? 3, 5, 10, 20, 50? This statement was made over 1,900 months ago. How can this failure be explained? Just a question. In 1864, Ellen White stated the human family was presented before me enfeebled. Every generation has been growing weaker and disease of every form visits the human race. Satan's power upon the human family increases. If the Lord should not soon come and destroy his power, the earth would soon be depopulated. Testimony, Volume 8, page 94. In 1864, she said the earth would soon be depopulated. Did that happen soon after 1864? Well, today there are about 7 billion people. What does the word soon mean? Did she have divine foresight? Because it says up there the human family was presented before me in feeble. Just a question. Can we ask questions like that? In 1895, Alan White stated slavery will again be revived in the southern states. For the spirit of slavery still lives. Was slavery ever revived in the southern United States? Of course not. Since the Civil War ended, it has been a federal crime to engage in slavery. Since the end of the Civil War, there have been a few criminal operations that engage in slave labor, but when they are discovered by authorities, they are shut down and the owners are jailed. So it will not be officially accepted by the government of the United States. Slavery, as it was known then, was permanently abol abolished, and it will never be revived again in the United States. A failed prophecy? Possible. Of course, we have a different kind of slavery by people today, by people being in debt, over the head, usually by their own choice, because they buy everything they see. But not always. Some people are forced in borrowing because of poverty or whatever it may or may be or disease. Here's a statement in 1T131. I was shown the company present at the conference, said the angel, some food for worms, some subject to the last plagues, some will be alive and remain upon the earth to be translated at the coming of Yeshua, of Jesus. This statement was made in 1856, and everyone present in that meeting is now dead. Ellen White made no conditions for the fulfillment of this prophecy. It was a statement of fact, the way we read it. Her statement is plain and to the point. Obviously, it did not come true. In 1846, Mrs. White had a vision of the solar system. Mrs. Truesdale, a dedicated and sincere Adventist, was present during the vision. She describes how Mrs. White saw a tall, majestic people living on either Jupiter or Saturn. 
Sister White was in a very feeble health, and while prayers were offered in her behalf, the Spirit of God rested upon us. This was the first view of the planetary world. After counting aloud the moons of Jupiter and soon after those of Saturn, she gave a beautiful description of the rings of the latter. She then said the inhabitants are a tall, majestic people, so unlike the inhabitants of Earth, sin has never entered there. That's in the Great Advent Movement, Chapter 16, The Third Angel's Message. Could it be true? Are there tall, majestic people living on Jupiter and on Saturn? This may have been plausible in 1846, but with all we know about these planets today, we know it is impossible. Conditions on both planets are extremely inhospitable to live as we know it. These planets have no solid surface like the Earth. The surfaces consist entirely of a sea of liquid hydrogen, hundreds of miles deep. The atmospheric pressure is millions of times greater than the Earth. The pressure is enough to crush the strongest metals. Numerous space probes have examined these planets using advanced technology and have not detected any sign of life whatsoever. No plants, no animals, no tall people. Nothing but hydrogen, helium and other gases. I had a question as an example in early writings. Page 64, it states, In a view given June 27, 1850, my accompanying angel said, Do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus? As you should. Knowing that what the Greek name of Jesus means, I asked myself, would an angel from heaven be calling the son of Elohim by a Greek name instead of his Hebrew name, Yeshua, which means salvation? That expression, Jesus, by accompanying angel, is being repeated in the writings over and over again. Wouldn't an angel from heaven use his given Hebrew name that express his mission and character rather than a Greek name? Another example I found in early writings, 119. It states, my accompanying angel cried out with awful solemnity, Get ready, get ready, get ready, for the fierce anger of the Lord is soon to come. Knowing that the Lord is not a name but a title, would an angel from heaven be calling our Heavenly Father Lord, which means Baal, instead of by his real Hebrew name Yahweh, as is being mentioned almost 7,000 times in Scripture? In Deuteronomy 32.3 he states, Because I will publish the name of Yahweh, ascribe you greatness unto Elohim. Should I be asking these questions? Would that be biblical? It states prove all things. We have several examples in scripture when heavenly angels visited people. When Lot encountered angels in Genesis 19.13 and they said, Yahweh has sent us to destroy it meaning Sodom and Gomorrah. When Gideon encountered an angel in Judges 6.12, he stated, And the angel of Yahweh appeared unto him, and said unto him, Yahweh is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Angels from heaven didn't use Greek or pagan names of pagan gods, but they used Hebrew names. It was the translators that make us believe that they did. When an angel appears to Zac Zacharias in the most holy place, announcing the birth of John the Baptist, he told him, among other things in Luke one fifteen, for he shall be great in the sight of Yahweh. It doesn't say that he will be great in the sight of the Lord, meaning Baal. The translators again made that change. When the angel of Yahweh appeared to Joseph to announce the birth of the Messiah to Mary, he told him in Matthew 1, 19-25, and here's verse 21, She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yahshua, for he shall save his people from their sins. And then in verse 22, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of by Yahweh by the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with Christ with child, and shall bring forth a son, 
and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is El with us, God with us. It is being claimed that Ellen White held up an 18-pound Bible for 45 minutes in 1845. Yet in Second Spiritual Gifts, pages 78 to 79, it states that Ellen was holding the Bible all afternoon until sunset. Here is her statement. In this state, she continued all the afternoon until near sunset when she came out of vision. There it also states that the Bible did not weigh 18 pounds, but approximately 40 pounds. So what is correct? Should we ask that question? Today the White Estate admits that any evidence that she ever held up any large Bible for a great length of time is tenuous and cannot be validated. Although this claim cannot be validated, this Bible is still shown and admired at large gatherings of Seventh-day Adventists. I personally saw it and admired it. Why not admit that it never happened, as it cannot be validated? Why tell the people something that is not true, that is a lie? If it's not true, I wonder who came up with it to begin with. And for what reason and for what purpose? The Seventh-day Adventist Church as well as Ellen White claim that the doctrines and practices of the denomination are based only on the Bible. And it is further claimed that Ellen White's writings are to be tested by the scriptures. But a careful examination of the history of those doctrines and practices show that these are not accurate claims. Many of the distinctive Seventh-day Adventist doctrines and practices are not based on careful biblical interpretation alone, but on the Bible as seen through the eyes of Ellen White. In fact, some of them are based solely on the writings of Ellen White, totally separate from any biblical basis for the beliefs or practices. On one hand, Ellen White stated almost 100 times in a writing statements like, Leave the impression upon the mind that the Bible and the Bible alone is our rule of faith, and that the sayings and doings of men are not to be a criterion for our doctrines or actions, written in 1889. The Bible alone. On the other hand, she said, In ancient times God spoke to men by the mouth of prophets and apostles. In these days he speaks to them by the testimonies of his Spirit. There was never a time when God instructs his people more earnestly than he instructs them now concerning his will and the course that he would have them pursue. What does that she mean? Today God speaks through her testimonies. Or does it mean anything else? Can I take this statement at face value? The Bible only or the testimonies written by Ellen White or maybe both as some say? Don't we have a contradiction somehow? The question is what is it? Is it the Bible only? Or the testimonies written by Ellen White? Or is it both? This statement appeared in the official paper of the Church and the Review and Herald October 4, 8, uh, 1928, page 11. Seventh-day Adventists hold that Ellen White performed the work of a true prophet during the 70 years of her public ministry, as Samuel was a prophet, as Jeremiah was a prophet, as John the Baptist, so we believe that Mrs. White was a prophet to the Church of Christ today. Then the Adventist Review, December 23, 1982, page 9, it stated, We do not believe that the quality or decree of inspiration in the writings of Ellen White is different from that of Scripture. So this is the end here of tape one of DVD number one, and I will continue with DVD number two.